There's a happy land of promise over in the great beyond Where the saved of earth shall soon the glory share And where the souls of men shall enter and live on forevermore Everybody will be happy over there Oh, and everybody, everybody will be happy over there I know we will be so happy over there And we're gonna shout and sing praises to the never-ending age Everybody will be happy over there And then the ransomed of all ages will be singing round the throne In that land where no one ever knows a care Christians of all nations will join in the triumph song. Everybody will be happy over there. Oh, and everybody will be happy over there. Over there we will, we will be happy over there. And we're gonna shout and sing praise to the never. Everybody will be happy over there And there will meet the one who And who kept us by his grace And who brought us to that land so right and fair We will praise his name forever As we look upon his face Everybody will be happy over there
Turn your Bibles, if you will, to Luke chapter 13, and it has been so eloquently read, and I want to uh, pass over it again for the sake of emphasis for our word this morning, and I hope, trust, and pray that I'm preaching to somebody who needs this word this morning. Luke chapter 13, uh, and beginning at verse 1, and I'll be preaching this from the King James uh, Version, Luke 13 and verse 1. If you have it, say amen. Amen. The Bible says, there were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Or those 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay. But except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Church, this morning I want to preach to you on the subject, Lord, let it alone this year. Lord, let it alone this year. The story is told of a, a child who got up excited and happy on Christmas morning. And y'all know how excited and anticipating children can be. And the young man ran to the Christmas tree and he found the gift with his name on it, a big box. And he ripped the paper to shreds and he began to open the box. And inside he found... Uh, a Jack in the Box. Y'all remember Jack in the Box? Y'all, you ain't too old. You remember that? And, and, and he said, Mom, what is this? And she said, Son, it is a Jack in the Box. He said, well, well, how do I use it? She said, well, what you do is you just turn his little lever, and, and then at the end of the little song, uh, Jack comes out of the box. So the boy took his hand to the lever, and he began to turn. Y'all, y'all sing it with me. Come on. da 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 didn't come out of the box. He says, well, maybe I didn't do it fast enough. Come on, y'all. Jack Steele didn't come out of the box. The boy was frustrated. Y'all know us parents, when stuff malfunctions, praise the Lord, we get upset too. We paid all this money. And so they got dressed and they went down to the local toy store and they went to customer service and she put the jack on top of the counter and she said, ma'am, I got a problem. She said, ma'am, what's the problem? Well, the problem is jack ain't coming out the box. She said, ma'am, I'm so sorry. I, I, I'm so sorry. That's not what this was designed to do. She said, just give me one moment. So she took Jack and she went to the back. And a few moments later, she came back and she put a brand new Jack in the Box on the corner. And this time he turned it. And when he turned and it got to the end, end of the song, Jack popped out of the box. Praise the Lord. And the woman said, thank you so much for helping me. She said, ma'am, it's no problem. We wanted to make sure that you get the right thing because this was designed to work. Jack is supposed to come out of the box. And, and, and I have a question this morning. My question is to you, how long has God been turning your box? How many songs has he heard? Y'all gonna help me this morning. How, how many times has has he gotten to the end of the song and, and nothing comes out of the box? I'm, I believe this morning I came all the way to Montgomery to challenge you this morning that some of us here have gotten so used to mediocrity in life. We've gotten content with mediocrity. We got uh, frozen at the stage of contemplation and some of us ain't coming out of the box. And I understand, I understand it can be scary to come out of the box. 
If you ain't never been out the box, you, you, you say, I don't know what it's like to live like that. I want you to know that God has designed you to live outside of the box. In 2020, I believe that God is saying this is the year that you need to grow. Those of you here at Metro, you're part of this beautiful theme, Focus. I believe this is the year, if you focus, that God can get you out of your box. It doesn't matter how you got there. Somebody may have put you in your box. Some circumstances may have fixed you in your box. You, you might have had some stuff happen to you that, that you woke up one day and you didn't know you were in a box. And now that you are, I want you to understand, it doesn't matter how you got there. I believe God is good enough, faith. I think he has enough strength. He has enough power. He has enough might to get you into a place of productivity. And our text today is centered around this idea that God has something more for us. It starts out with an interesting time in scripture. In Luke 12, Jesus has made some statements that have ruffled some feathers. He's said some things that have bothered some folk. It has upset the equilibrium of, of many folks. And, and by the time he gets to chapter 13, uh, uh, you know, sometimes when you get too high on life, you begin to talk bigger than what you really are. And the disciples have been walking with Jesus so long that at this point they consider they can just, they think rather they can just say stuff. And so they recognize uh, it, that there was a scene where some folk came to sacrifice. They, they came to give God their best. And, and we don't know what the situation was, but some folk end up being killed. That it was such a bloody display that the blood from the sacrifices mixed with the blood of those that were killed. We don't know historically what happened, but we know it was a bad day at church that day. The Bible goes on to tell us that the disciples who, who heard about this and saw this, they came and told Jesus, basically these folks must have been some bad folks to die at church like this. And let me add this parenthetically and say to you that don't you get it twisted. Just because bad things happen to people doesn't mean it's their fault. There are some of us who have developed a posture of judge, being judgmental where we look at some of the circumstances that people go through. We look at the hurts and the calamities that they experience and we come to the conclusion like Job's friends, you must have did something. And Jesus checks them real quick. And say, wait a minute, do you think that because of the way they died that somehow your righteousness exceeds theirs? Because unless you repent, you're going to die too. And Jesus says, for example, there was a tower that fell and killed 18 people. Y'all think that y'all better than them? And Jesus decides to teach them this lesson about self-awareness and about personal productivity by teaching a parable. And I like how Jesus does this because there are some times in Jesus' ministry where he would speak directly to something. He would he would stand up and stand flat-footed and speak to an issue. It's almost like when some of you were growing up and there was a problem and your parent dealt with you where you messed up. Anybody here, you grew up, you didn't wait to get home. If you cut up here, I'll get you here. Amen. But Jesus decides to do something a little different. He decides to speak indirectly to them by using a parable. That's almost like the way some of you grew up like me. My grandmother, every now and then, she would deal with me directly. And sometimes she would say, you know, I used to know a story of a little boy who thought he was grown too. And you knew she was talking about you. Jesus makes this same attempt in this text. And so he begins the parable. And there are three things that I think this parable teaches you about the kind of focus and the kind of intention, the kind of posture that you need to have about the growth that God is pursuing for your life. Number one, I want you to know this morning that God will put you in a perfect position. That's right. Yeah, that's right. God will put you in a perfect position. God will put you in the place that you need to be in order for you to grow. Right. You don't have to like the place. You don't have to even choose the place. Wherever God has you, he has you for a reason of your own growth. Right. So Jesus starts the parable by saying, number one in verse six, he said, a certain man. Everybody say a certain man. Certain man. He said, a certain man had a fig tree. 
Now, this is interesting because Jesus uses the fig tree on a number of occasions in his teaching, which often the fig tree will represent Israel. It will represent God's special people. But uh, this text doesn't just talk about a fig tree. It gives us the location of the fig tree. The Bible says that a man had a fig tree, and get this, it is planted in his vineyard. Now, Jesus doesn't say this on accident. Because he wants to show us that that fig tree is not planted around other fig trees. That this fig tree is planted in a vineyard. Let, let me help you understand the importance of it this way. Let me try to find a good preacher way uh, to, to say this, Kenyon. Um, some of you are what we call wine connoisseurs. For some of you that are even more holy, you are uh, fans of the ancient fruit of the vine. Uh, I, I'm trying, Jeff. I'm trying, Jeff. Uh, so, so some of you uh, have taken a liking to uh, one of the original of the original. Say amen when you can. And, 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 Lord have mercy. And for those of you, you recognize that there are a number of variations. Uh, types uh, distinctions that uh, give a different type of of taste and experience if you understand say amen uh, and the way that you have all those variations is because the manufacturer knows how to produce them but in the biblical times, you couldn't just go to the grocery store and, and get what you wanted. You, you had to grow it, and you had to grow it a different way. So watch this. If they wanted their wine to taste a certain way, they would plant other fruit trees inside of the vineyard. That means that the fig tree is in the vineyard so that it can um, give a certain type of influence of flavor for that year's produce. Uh, so, so the wine would taste a little fig-like. Are y'all with me here? I want you to understand that the Bible does this because it's helping us to understand that God is very particular about how he places us in certain places in our lives. And I want you to understand that God doesn't have, make accidents. He doesn't have accidents in his development of our lives. That when God made you, that he did not have some uh, 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 some assembly line and just said, give me a leg and give me a hand and give me an arm. The Bible said we are fearfully and wonderfully created. That God took his time on all of us. That he didn't just assign us a number, but he knows us by our names. And he doesn't just reach in an arbitrary bag of gifts and throw singing and throw teaching and, and throw all those things at us. That God takes his time with us. But, everybody say but. but. The Bible says that once he planted this fig tree, he came by, verse 6 says, and sought fruit thereon and found none. This is interesting because I don't want you to think that the text is teaching that this tree was planted and then three years later he's looking for something on the tree. This tree has been in this vineyard for quite some time. Lord have mercy. It, it's been in the church for many seasons. It's, it's been around for a long time, but it isn't bearing any fruit. And this is upsetting. This is this is an issue because fig trees produce uh, uh, figs at least twice a year. Which means that by the third year, the owner has come by this tree and there have been six seasons. Y'all ain't going to help me. Six opportunities, six times that this should have produced and it has produced nothing. And what's upsetting about this is that the owner knows that it has been put in the proper position to grow. And what I want you to understand this morning is that God has put you in the place where you're supposed to grow. And what's also interesting is the Bible then tells us, and I want you to mark this as number two, that God not only will put you in the right position, but he will investigate your progress. Look at the text. The Bible says, verse seven, then said he unto the dresser of the vineyard, watch this y'all. He said, behold, three years 
I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree and I don't find none. And a lot of scholars have quibbled over what these three years mean. Some decide to take the numerological position and say, well, the three years is the year. Three is the number of completedness. So perhaps uh, it has had all the time it needs. And, and there's a lot of reason why that could be the interpretation. But if I may uh, uh, use my imagination a little bit here, I, I remember uh, an old principal one time told me something about progress professionally. And he said, you know, uh, uh, when I would tell young principals going into new schools, he said, I would tell them that the first year that when things don't go wrong, it's the last guy's fault. That's right. That's right. It, it's his fault. He put some stuff in place and, 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 and it's a barrier to you and, and you're going to have some issues. Year number one, somebody else's fault. Year number two, he said when things don't go well, he said you can just blame it on the process. It's just the process. Uh, some things got to work out. Some things got to come together and the stars ain't aligned right. Say amen if you know what I mean. Amen. He said, but if you don't get that school together in three years, it isn't the last person's fault. It isn't the process. It's your fault. May I ask you a question this morning? What year are you on? Are you in year one where you're saying that I have not produced because it's somebody else's fault? That they, they said something to me and it made me upset and I stopped coming to the meeting because I didn't care no more. And they need to understand that if they're going to handle me and deal with me, they're going to have to treat me right. And, and you're wasting all this time because of what somebody else said and what somebody else has done. Or are you in year two? Well, I'm, I'm about to. I'm, I'm fitting to. Shoulda, woulda, y'all ain't gonna help me here. Coulda. Are, are you saying I'm, I'm about to, I'm just in the process, or are you honest enough to say that I recognize in my life that the reason why I'm not where I need to be is not because of somebody else. It's not because of the process. I didn't have enough time. It is because of you, you know why you didn't shout loud right there? Because the easiest person to fix is somebody else. You know why I got real quiet right there? Because the easiest thing to figure out uh, is somebody else's life. But when you got to look in the mirror at your own situation, anybody here witness that I know how to size up somebody else's stuff. I can see far away what other people need to do. But I recognize that when I look in the mirror, there's some stuff I got to work on. Y'all ain't going to help me here. That I recognize that I got to take care of myself. Three years. Everybody say three years. Three years have gone by and nothing is on the tree. And so the owner makes a suggestion. He said, here's what I think we ought to do. He said, here it is. Cut it down. Faith is going to get quiet right here. Help us. Let me. Can we go to school for a minute? He says, Greg, he says, cut it down. Now, the Greek there uh, has a prefix, ek. Everybody say ek. ek. Many of you are familiar with this uh, prefix because you've heard it on that word ekklesia that we have damaged. Uh, Lord have mercy. This idea of being called out or the greater idea of assembling for the purpose of of fellowship with Christ and those that are with him. This idea that I'm being called out. The prefix ek is on this word, cut it down. And there are times when Jesus uses the term, this is why you have to be contextual with terms, there are times where he literally means cut it down or cut it off. Jesus said, if your right hand offends you, cut it But we're talking about agriculture, agriculture and not limbs. And what Jesus is saying here is not cut it down because when something is cut down, it can grow back up. When you cut your grass, you got to go cut it again. But there's a difference when you cut your grass and when you pull up roots. The owner is saying, I have invested in this tree. I have spent my own resources. I have spent my own time. I have taken uh, time and liberties to try to help this tree grow and mature. But if it ain't going to grow, cut it out. Lord have mercy. The question I had, God, why would you want to cut something out 
Just because it ain't growing. And then the Lord told me, Faith, he said, keep reading. Because the text says, cut it out. Why cumbereth it the ground? Y'all, that word cumbereth, it means to make no effect. Besides being barren, the tree injures the soil. Come here, come, come here. Not only is it unfruitful, but it's drawing away the juices, which the vines would extract from the earth. It intercepts the sun and it occupies room. One translation says, why is it even using up the soil? One translation says, why does it make the ground useless? Y'all ain't gonna help me here. One translation says, why should it take up space? Another translation says, it's taking up space we can use for something else. Uh, I, I remember when I was in the seventh grade, uh, and historically, I'm not a math student. Math just ain't my, it ain't my thing. And I remember in the seventh grade, I got to the point, I said, well, I, I've had it, I ain't gonna learn no more because I don't care. The teacher is up there teaching and she's doing her thing and she said, Tim Anderson? And I said, what? And y'all already know this story ain't gonna work out good. It ain't gonna be good. Mm -hmm. Mouth too big. She said, Tim Anderson, I've got an equation up on the board and I want you to come up here and solve it. So I went up there and I got the chalkboard. Y'all remember chalk? I got the chalkboard and I I looked at the equation. I thought real hard. And I knew what to do. I got a piece of chalk and I wrote, I don't know. Everybody started laughing and I I knew how I had done my job. And went and sat down. And after the laughing calmed down, the teacher stared at me across the room. She said, Tim Anderson? I said, what? She said, you know what your problem is? You're killing the soil. I said, killing the soil? What's your, what you talking about killing? What does that mean? She said, you know Johnny, who sits on your right? Johnny was an A student before he sat next to you. Now the boy making C's. You know Amber on your left? Amber was barely making a C. Now she got the front class. Y'all, y'all, it just, y'all. She's saying, you have decided you don't want to grow. But what you don't understand is that you are affecting the people around you that could be better, that could be stronger, that could be wiser, that could be making progress, that could be changing the world, that could be saving souls, y'all ain't gonna help me here, that could be using their gifts and manifesting it in the lives of somebody else. But since you decided not to grow, you're killing the soil. I came all the way to Montgomery to tell you, don't you, don't you, listen, don't you think just because you don't want to grow that it don't mean nothing in the world, it don't mean nothing in your family, it don't mean nothing in your house, it don't mean nothing in the church. When you decide fundamentally that you are no longer willing to grow and get outside of your box, you are killing the destiny of the people that God has placed in your life. Your kids are depending on you to get out of your box. The grandkids you have not met yet are depending on you getting out of the box. The child of God who's out on the street who will be a member of this church in five years is depending on you right now to get out of the box. He doesn't just plant. He investigates progress. And so, finally, I want you to know, and your prayer ought to be this, Lord, let me alone. Watch this, watch this. If I do this right, if the Holy Spirit hits you right, you're going to only walk out of here and say, Lord, let me alone this year. 
Watch the text and we'll close. The Bible says in verse 8, and he answering, now watch this, the owner of the field being represented as the father says, he ain't growing. It might be time to cut him on out. But the dresser of the vineyard, he answered and he said, Lord, I care so much. I know what she can be. Before we made her, we looked into the future and we knew what she can accomplish. Lord, I love her. Lord, I, I'm concerned about her. So, so what I'm asking is for you to let him alone this year. Lord, have mercy. You are only here because the conclusion of the conversation about you ended with let them alone this year. And here you are on the first time I had Because get this, it's not just the time that occurs if you're blessed. And I want you to understand, y'all, getting old is not always a blessing. Some of us are only older because we haven't used our time right and we've been given some delays. Some of us are only still around because God is a little more time. He's supposed to get out of here 10 years ago, but... Watch, watch, watch. So what's going to happen in this year? The manager says, I got a suggestion. Let, let, let Tim Manderson get one more year. But, but, but I'm going to do some stuff to make sure that this ain't just another year. To, to, to make sure that this time, 2021, he ain't still sitting around talking about, well, I'm about to. I, I, I know I need to. Well, what you going to do? Here's what I'm going to do. I, I, I got I to gotta dig. I got to dig around them. And I want you to understand what the digging means, church. Watch this. The digging serves, get this, to loosen the soil. To allow the water to sink down to the roots. To allow the room for the roots to grow. And if no fruit comes from this tree after that, it's a bad tree. Come, come here. Because God is saying, if I give you some more time, it's some stuff I'm going to have to cut from you. Lord have mercy. That there are some things that, that you hold on to that's blocking the sunlight, blocking the nourishment, blocking the enrichment. There are some things that you have idolized, that you're holding and if you're going to progress in this year, there's some stuff I got to cut away. Can I be real in here? Can I tell the truth? I came too far to lie to you. There are not only some things, there are some people that God is going to have to cut out of your life. And Lord have mercy. Sometimes y'all it is the very people in our lives that are blocking the sun from shining the way it should. And you got to have enough faith in God. It don't matter how much you love them. It doesn't matter how much you like them. It doesn't matter how much codependency that you have. Somebody understand what I mean there? That God is going to have to do some cutting. Some of you are not further in your life because you got people that you won't move. And God has said, watch out, Jack. I can do it for you. Anybody here ever had to have God cut somebody for you? Yeah. That you didn't have the strength to do it on your own? You didn't have the strength to say, I, I just can't do it. I, I can't handle it no more. I can't deal with it. And isn't it interesting how God said, don't worry, Doc, stand back. I'll take care of it.
serving myself. And y'all, sometimes it doesn't mean that they're bad people. There are some people that you're connected to that you connected to. The Bible said what God has put together. And some of y'all got folk in your life, God. He said, I got to dig it. Everybody say dig it. But, but that's not all. He said, I got to dig it. But, but he also says, I got to dung it. Y'all know what dung is, right? Yeah, yeah. I, you know, we in the country, but th this is a, this is a big city, y'all. I don't have to do a class on dumb doing. Watch this, watch this. The Bible said, God said, listen. Not only uh, Jesus said, not only will I will I cut some stuff away, but I gotta dung it. I, I've got to put some ugly stuff around it. See, the process is when manure is placed on and around the base of the tree as well as in the soil to increase the potential of growth. In other words, he's saying, I gotta, I gotta bring this tree through some ugly things. I, I gotta allow some some smelly, ugly things to happen to this tree. Is there anybody here who's a witness that I've had to go through some ugly stuff? I, I've had to go through some nasty stuff. I, I've had to go through some messed up stuff to get where I am. Don't you get, don't let my Bible fool you. There's some ugly stuff that I've had to experience and, and I didn't like it. I, I didn't like how people looked at me when I went through it. I, I didn't like the way I smelled it. I didn't like the way I looked. But is there anybody here who's a witness to say on the other side of it, I'm glad that I went through some of the things that I went through. I'm glad that I Because I would not be where I am without some ugly things in life. Now, as we wrap this up, uh, the Bible says in verse 9, and if. Don't miss this. Everybody say, and if. Watch this. Three years, no growth. No fruit. Six seasons. All the time he needed, all the resources that she needed, she had no growth. And the Lord says, let it alone. Cut me, but don't kill me. Let me alone this year. And Jesus says, now after going through this, after we expend and exhaust our resources, and if it bear fruit, watch this faith. The text says, well, I said, God, what this mean? What you mean, well? He said, there's no party. Come on, preach them. There's no celebration. No, no, no. Just do what you're supposed to do. There, there's no, the, the preacher gave me a certificate. There's no heavenly Holy Ghost party. Help us. There's no high five. There's. There's no pat on the back. No. Why? Because that's what you're supposed to do. You were made to grow. You're supposed to come out of the box at the end of the song. You're supposed to get better. So if it bears some fruit, cool. <laughs> And the most, the scariest words in the Bible. And if not, then after that, thou shalt, and now we understand it better, cut it out. Did you hear that? That at some point, God is going to look at it, look at us, and if we've not taken the opportunity, God going to say, time's up. Then all we can do. And don't get mad at God because you do it to other people too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Some of y'all came in this year, I ain't giving her no more money. I, I, I'm not giving her no more money. Some of y'all this year, you went into this year, I ain't picking him up no more. He, he ain't got a car by now, it's been six years. I, I, the gas too high out here. Don't play with me. Listen. Some of y'all went through this year. I, 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 no, no, I ain't asking.
answer the phone no more. Don't call, you only call because you come, come on, help me, somebody. You only call because you want something. So you do it all the time. So don't get mad at God. God is saying, I'm through. Now I don't want to end it on a bad note. So let me say it to you this way. Dr. Tony Evans gave this illustration one day. He said there was there was a young couple that just got married. And they were so happy and so in love. They got in the car and they're on their way down the road to their honeymoon destination. As they held hands on the on the highway, they were just so excited about this brand new life together. As the story goes, that they went around a corner, a car had moved into their lane and there was a head-on collision. When the husband came to, he looked over and he saw his beautiful bride bleeding to death in the passenger seat. He was frantic, he was upset, he, he didn't know what to do and the only thing he could think of was to, to get her out of the car. He frantically got out of the car, went to her side, pried the door open, pulled her up, and, and he held her in his hands, and she was still holding on to life. And, and so he just figured, I'll just walk down the road, and somebody has got to help me. Yeah. As he walked down the road, he began to see a building, and the building looked familiar. And he went up to the building, and he saw a sign, and it said, Dr. David Williams. He began to be happy because he said, this is the opportunity. She, she can be healed. There's a doctor in the house. Yeah. He takes his bleeding bride to the door and he slams on the door. And the doctor came to the door. He opened it up and the man looked at the doctor. He said, doctor, please save her. Yeah. The doctor stepped back. He looked at the man and he looked at the, the wife and he looked back at the man. He said, sir, I'm, I'm so sorry. He said, I, I stopped practicing years ago. The husband, in shock by this response, looked down at his bleeding wife and he looked back up at the doctor and he said, doctor, then do me a favor. Take down your son. Yes, sir. Wow. Come on, doc. Yes, sir. Wow. Yeah. You have given me the impression based on the sign that you're going to help in the worst moment of my life, your sign told me that you're here to heal. That in this tragic moment in my life where my wife's life is leaving her body, your sign says that you can help. And if you ain't gonna help, take down your sign. I came to tell somebody this morning, if you ain't gonna grow, take your sign down. If you don't wanna be better, Take your sign down. If you don't want to use the resources that God has given you to try to advance and grow and develop something into your life that can be used for the glory of God, do us all a favor. Take, take your sign down. Because as long as your sign is up, as long as you're telling somebody that you are a Christian, you are communicating to people that you trust and serve the one true God who has all the power to save, heal, give hope, and bring light in darkness. And if you ain't going to grow, if you will not commit your life to God, if you are going to watch the destiny of the people around you die because of your inadequacies, then take down your sign. And if you're going to leave it up, Ask God, let me alone this year. Do what you got to do because I want to be better. 